Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Frank Connor. I'm the chair of the psychology department. Welcome to what is the third in our fourth psychology department speaker series of this year. Um, it's good to see you all here. It is my pleasure to introduce today's presenter. It is Dr. Brian Singer. Uh, Dr. Singer is a research fellow and lecturer at the University of Michigan. Uh, Dr. Singer did his undergraduate work at the University of Chicago. He also received his PhD from the University of Chicago. So please welcome Dr. Singer. All right, well, thank you for inviting me to come here today. I'm excited to share some of this research with you, um, as well as uh, uh, tell you about different opportunities and what you can do in a biopsychology lab. Um, if you have any questions throughout the talk, just feel free to raise your hand or shout out, and I'll, I'll be sure to get to you, OK? All right, so today I'm going to be talking about understanding the neurobiology of addiction in humans through the study of animals. And you know, for the most part, I'll be talking about studies that involve rats. Rats are uh, a very popular animal to study addiction in because we can study very complex behaviors in them, um, as you'll see throughout the talk. So I just want to give a little bit of background on addiction and why it's important to study. So um, as you've probably learned from your general psychology courses, it's a disorder manifested by several cognitive behavioral maladaptations. And I believe these are here are described in the DSM-4, but that's now been updated um, to DSM-5, which contains little variance on these. But these include continued use despite negative consequences, intake of larger than intended doses of the drug, um, excessive engagement in activities to obtain the drug and re or recover from its effects, and withdrawal symptoms upon discontinuation. OK, and so these are just some examples. Um, you don't necessarily need to fulfill all these examples to be considered to have a substance use disorder. For example, not all drugs produce a physical withdrawal syndrome. Um, but these are examples of things that I'm going to try to be modeling in the animal research I'll be talking about. Um, so drug addiction is a big problem in the US. 22.6 um, million Americans aged 12 or older, about 9% of the population are current drug users. Um, and then here are some stats regarding psychostimulant drugs. Um, psychostimulants are drugs like cocaine and amphetamine um, that stimulate the nervous system and they uh, cause movement. Um, oftentimes we test psychostimulant drugs by looking at how much a rat or mouse will run around in response to a drug. Um, but you can see here that 2.7 million people use illicit psychostimulants, again, such as cocaine and amphetamine. And another 1.1 million abuse stimulant psychotherapeutics non-medically. So for this, uh, I'm talking about things like Adderall or Ritalin that are, 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 have, have psychotherapeutic uses. Uh, another use, other than for ADHD, of, of psychotherapeutic drugs would be um, narcolepsy. So different amphetamine-like compounds are used for treating narcolepsy. Um, there are various health complications that can arise from repeated stimulant use. This includes psychosis. Amphetamine psychosis is a big problem. It has a lot of similar symptoms to schizophrenia. Um, and then cocaine in particular can cause seizures and various cardiovascular problems. Um, and a lot of you know, these health complications vary according to how you take the drug, whether you're snorting it, inhaling it, uh, injecting it, uh, and so forth. So it, they, they're, they're dependent on how quickly the drug gets into your system and affects your brain. And so that's called a pharmacokinetic factor. Um, and addiction is very expensive. So it, the disease-related expenses can total above $600 billion annually in the US. OK. So today, I'm going to be focusing on a very specific part of addiction. And this is this idea that it's a compulsive need for use of and of a habit-forming substance. So this is the dictionary definition of addiction. Um, and so again, I want to focus on what, what does this mean, this habit-forming substance? Is drug addiction really a habit? OK. So is this accurate? Sorry. Is this accurate? 
And so here are some examples that I pulled off of the internet. So addiction is commonly referred to as a drug habit. Um, but I think that maybe describing addiction as a bad habit can often trivialize drug abuse. It may actually be, be an inaccurate description of the disease. And so here are you know, some examples from Google News recently uh, from uh, early September about you know, uh, talking about a drug habit in the literature. Um, also some you know, uh, 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 quotes from, from Twitter talking about you know, a drug habit being you know, addiction to famous Amos cookies or something like that. Now, uh, food addiction is a big problem um, and involves a lot of the same sort of biological uh, factors, but you can see that how the, this term drug habit might be a bit overused in the public. Okay. And this is going. Okay, so what is habitual behavior? So there are a couple quick examples of this. So it could be the same actions repeated over and over again. These actions become automatic, they're not motivated, they're just you do them without thinking about them. Um, they're insensitive to devaluation of the reward. So what do I mean by this? So in, in a classic sort of animal study, what you do is you know, normally rats like you know, little sugar pellets, okay? So if a rat has to do a behavior to you know, get sugar pellets, that can then initially be a motivated behavior, but over time, it can be a habitual behavior, okay? It just is doing something continuously to get that sugar pellet. So if you can devalue those sugar pellets by giving that rat an enormous quantity of sugar pellets, and so it should no longer want the sugar pellets, right? There's no more reward in the sugar pellets because it's full. And so you're devaluing the sugar pellets. But if the rat is still going to work for the sugar pellets, that would be a habit, okay? It's doing something, it's doing this behavior even though there's no, it doesn't want the reward anymore. Um, and so that gets into this imbalance between goal-directed and what I call perseverative uh, responding. So again, it's not motivated, it's just continuing to do this even if it doesn't want the reward. Um, and its habits can be less regulated by cognitive or inhibitory control. So a lot of cortical processes. So the two that I'm going to be focusing on are the top two, same actions repeated over and over again, and this automatic nature of habits. And so are these habit responses necessary characteristics of substance abuse disorder? And so I'm going to try to model that in a rat. And the reason why I got into this and was interested in this was because one thing I saw, and this is just an example, so this is a liquor store in Ann Arbor. It's called Maine Liquors. And I was out and about at that time of the day at 7 a.m. and this store should have been open. And there were actually a long line of people outside uh, sort of waiting for the store to be open. Um, but the store wasn't open. So instead of just sort of waiting there and just trying to figure out why the store wasn't open so they couldn't, couldn't get their alcohol, what, what happened was that someone realized that a different store down the street was open, the Beer Depot. And so, again, this is at 7 a.m. So what people did was they changed their behavior and they went down the street to the beer depot. So they, they, they altered their behavior according to changing circumstances. And so their behavior wasn't a habit, it was motivated to go do something different. They weren't just standing there, you know, keeping on trying to get into this store. They actually changed where they went, did and went over to this other liquor store. So, what I'm trying to say is that people have to change their behavior and adapt to specific situations in order to obtain drug, okay? And so this idea that drug seeking is only habitual, I, I think might be a misnomer. Drug seeking may not be entirely habitual. Now the act of actually taking a drug might become habitual, like just sitting there drinking a beer, doing this type of behavior continuously, but going out, searching for a drug, going to one dealer one day, another dealer the next day, might not be necessarily a habit in and of itself. People have to change their behavior and adapt to different situations. And so one thing that I wanted to look into was do rodent models of addiction actually account for this non-habitual, potentially drug-seeking behavior, okay? 
And to look at this, what we do is we have a rat. So that's an example of uh, one of the rats, uh, type of rats that we use in our study. This is called a Long Evans rat. Um, and we place it in this chamber, which is called a Skinner box or an operant chamber. And what happens is it's the performance of an action, an operant, which might be a lever press or a nose poke into a little hole. So rats like, and rodents in general, like to poke their nose into holes. So either a lever press or a nose poke results in the delivery of a reward. And the reward is called a reinforcer. And that increases the probability that they'll repeat that action. So if they press a lever and get a reward, they're more likely to press that lever again. OK, so that's reinforcement learning. And so in this case, the action is instrumental in producing the consequence. So this is the type of chamber that we'll be uh, using in our studies that I'll describe today. Um, and this reward here, the rat is nose poking into this little hole. It's probably getting either a sugar pellet or you know, maybe some sort of sucrose solution or something like that. Could also be an alcohol solution. And over here, you have a lever. And that's a lever that it presses to get the reward. And oftentimes in these studies, you have these little Q lights. So the Q lights are paired usually with reward delivery. Okay, And so it's sort of like a stimulus. It's a conditioned stimulus that tends to then predict reward. So if you then show that Q light, the rat might be more motivated to you know, uh, go get reward and search out for reward again. It's sort of like going into the bar, seeing the bar setting, and then wanting to drink. Okay. The Q light becomes a motivator of getting rewarded. OK, and so this is, generally speaking, how we set up a drug self-administration experiment in a rat. And so what we have here is a rat, and <laughs> a cartoon of a rat, I should say. And what we first do is we do a surgery in which we implant a catheter that puts some tubing directly into its jugular vein. OK? Then the tubing comes out of the rat and is hooked up to this tether. And that gets connected to a syringe that has drug or saline in it uh, that's in, uh, connected to an infusion pump and also a computer. OK? So what happens is if the rat, for example, presses this lever, it notifies the computer that the lever was pressed. And it turns on this infusion pump for a period of time, which will then deliver drug to the rat directly into its circulatory system, directly into its jugular vein. And so once it gets the drug, which in our case will be cocaine, it can get to the brain within 20 seconds, 30 seconds. And we can measure that in a variety of ways. Um, and so, so this IV catheter. Uh, implantation is a very well accepted, very standard way of doing this type of experiment. And you can control the amount of drug uh, the rat gets by just changing the amount of time uh, the infusion pump is on. So that's how you change the dose of the drug. And generally speaking, in terms of the rat actually administering the drug, one of the standard procedures that is used is this thing called a fixed ratio schedule of reinforcement. So basically what that means, and it's abbreviated FR, is that there's a drug delivery every n presses or so. So if you have an FR1, that means fixed ratio 1. That means there's a reinforcement for every one lever press. So every lever press, the rat gets a single injection of cocaine. Okay, And that's what we'll use in the studies that I'll tell you about later on. So this is called continuous reinforcement, but you can make it a little bit more difficult. So for example, FR5 means there's reinforcement for every five lever presses. Okay, And so there's lots of different schedules. They produce lots of different effects in terms of biology uh, uh, and uh, the psychology of whether how much the rats actually want the drug. Um, and then the other important thing to note is that animals and people will work for drugs. Okay, So these experiments have been done in both animals and people. Generally speaking, animals show addiction-like behavior to the same drugs that people self-administer. So for example, both animals and people can take cocaine. Both animals and people self-administer amphetamine. Both animals and people self-administer heroin, all these things. Um, there are some drugs that animals will not self-administer. 
And so these tend to be hallucinogen type drugs. So an animal is not going to self-administer LSD, for example, um, whereas a person would self-administer LSD. That being said, there's some debate in the literature whether LSD is actually an addictive drug or if it's just an abuse drug. So that's something to consider. OK, so you can imagine that in most studies, uh, self-administration studies, rats press a lever many times over the course of several hours, sometimes up to six, 10 hours a day, um, to directly self-administer a drug. Um, so the pursuit of drug becomes habitual and automatic. The rat, you know, for maybe days, weeks, months on end, is just sitting there pressing a lever continuously, maybe on that FR1 schedule. So every lever press means one infusion of cocaine. Okay? And so that is a very habitual behavior. But I would argue that's not what people do. People aren't just sitting there taking cocaine continuously for hours and hours and hours on end. People tend to sort of monitor their brain cocaine levels a bit. They intermittently binge on cocaine. Okay? So I don't think that this is that reliable or, as I say, translational uh, of, of a model. When I say translational, I mean that the animal reliably replicates the human condition. The model replicates the human condition. OK? So here's another model uh, of this habitual behavior in animals. And so what this is, this is pretty confusing. And I don't want to get into the nitty gritty details. But this is a very standard model uh, of drug addiction in rats. And what it is, it's, it's called a second order schedule of reinforcement. And the basic idea is that there are these cue lights, and there's a lot of responding. But you know, it, the rats only get one infusion of cocaine after about 15 minutes. Okay, And the, the rat doesn't really know what it's doing, so it's just continuously pressing the lever over and over and over and over and over again for 15 minutes. It doesn't know what's going to happen, but all of a sudden it gets cocaine. And so what happens is there's a weak relationship between this vigorous responding and the one cocaine injection. And that vigorous responding over time results in this very habitual behavior. Okay? It's no longer motivated behavior, it's just a habit. And so the important thing to know, and I'll get into this in more detail later on in the talk when I'm talking more about the biology, is that since this model promotes habit formation, you get changes in brain areas that are responsible for habits. OK? And you know, the brain area that's responsible for habits is called the dorsal lateral striatum. And specifically, there's a molecule called a neurotransmitter in the dorsal lateral striatum called dopamine, which I'm sure you've all heard of, that has been shown to be responsible for mediating habits there. So for example, if you have an animal that's you know, been trained on this type of self-administration procedure, that promotes habits, if you then go in and actually inject uh, a drug that blocks dopamine transmission in that brain area, what you get is a decrease in responding. So you block the expression of the habits. Okay? So you block dopamine re receptors uh, that bind dopamine in the dorsal lateral striatum. You block habitual responding on this type of behavior. Does that make sense to everybody? So the opposite is also true. So brain regions that are responsible for more motivated behavior and not necessarily habits are not affected by these types of behavioral experiments. So for example, there's another area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. Um, it's part of this area called the ventral striatum, as opposed to the dorsal striatum that I talked about in the, the last uh, slide. So here, actually, here is the dorsal striatum up here. It's dorsal, so higher up in the brain. And down here is the ventral striatum in which the cumbens is part of. So the important thing here is, though, that if you inject this dopamine receptor antagonist, so if you block dopamine receptors in the ventral striatum, you don't block habitual responding because this area and dopamine levels in this area are not regulating habit. Instead, normally, if they would regulate motivated behavior. And I'll give another example of this later on. Does this all make sense? So you have two brain areas, dorsal lateral striatum, responsible for habits, 
ventral striatum or nucleus accumbens responsible for motivated behavior and not habits. Good? Okay, so substance abuse is often studied using animal models that promote habit formation. So therefore, a couple of things have been hypothesized. First, habits are necessary for this transition from casual drug use to misuse and abuse. So this has been a you know, well-accepted thing in the literature. And then the other thing is that dopamine transmission is in the dorsolateral striatum, or DLS, is responsible for this transition to addiction. Okay. So the two questions I want to ask are, is the development of habitual drug seeking, seeking really required for the transition to addiction? Okay, do you need habits to be addicted? And then the other question is, what types of brain plasticity, brain changes, are responsible for addiction if habit formation is not necessary? Does it still involve these same areas of the brain, like the dorsolateral striatum? And so again, the idea is that people have to change their behavior and adapt to specific situations in order to t obtain drug. And so I'm suggesting that maybe drug seeking itself is not purely a habit. Does this all make sense? Good. OK, so how do we model this? How do we start by building this type of procedure? So the first thing that we do is we start with an animal model of addiction, which shows addiction-like behavior in rats. And so the type of model that I decided to use is called the intermittent access schedule. So what it is, is basically what happens is that animals get five minutes of access to cocaine, followed by 25 minutes of, of a timeout period where there's no cocaine available at all. Okay, so. What it is, is it's a model of animals intermittently sort of binging on cocaine in a given s session. So here is just an example of how the rats are, are taking cocaine. So they're taking cocaine in these spiking levels and then come back down. So they're spiking brain cocaine concentrations and the concentrations go back down. And this here is the accumulation of cocaine, uh, how much cocaine they've taken across the entire day. Okay. But again, this is trying to model how people potentially take drug. They spike their cocaine levels, and then they come back down. In a little while, they take more cocaine, and then they come back down. Okay? So this is an intermittent access model. And there are a few things that, you know, that are really helpful about this model in terms of its, its translational nature, in terms of its modeling the human condition. The first is that across weeks of training, Rats take more and more and more drug over time, so they escalate their intake. So that's, you know, you know, a DSM type criteria of addiction. Um, the other thing is they show this enhanced motivation for drug. So you can do these sort of behavioral economic tests and ask how much the rats are willing to pay for drug. So for example, if you cause the the the, if you increase the number of lever presses required to get a single infusion of a drug. Um, that might be increasing the cost of the drug, so the rats will have to work harder to obtain the drug. Um, conversely, what you can do, and what I'll show you some data for, is you can reduce the drug, the, reduce the dose of the drug over time, so that a single lever press becomes more and more expensive. Okay, and so at some point in time, the rats are just going to be like, okay, this is too expensive. I'm not going to press the lever for this tiny, tiny dose of the drug. Okay, so that's how you can manipulate price and see how motivated, how much desire there is to obtain the drug. You can also look at continued use despite negative consequences. So for that, what we do is we give the rat, uh, if, if, the drug ta if the rat takes the drug, we give it a mild foot shock. If that foot shock decreases drug taking, that means um, that the rats might not be super motivated for the drug. But you know, if the rat continues to take the drug despite this foot shock, you know, it, it models the human condition in that, you know, the, 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 the person might, you know, continue taking the drug despite, you know, losing their job or something like that. And then the other thing is uh, this high propensity for relapse. So exposure to cues that are associated with drug use, do they spur 
again, wanting and taking of drug again. So it's like going to the bar, seeing the bar atmosphere, and then wanting to drink. Or alternatively, taking a little, if, if you're an alcoholic, you've been sober for a long time, but then you take a little taste of alcohol, and that can spur this whole spiral into wanting to drink again. So this is how, how cues you know, promote relapse. Um, yeah. OK, and so we're going to start with that intermittent access model. Okay, and it's useful because, as you'll see in a second, there are these long periods of time, those 25-minute blocks, in which the rat is not doing anything. It doesn't have access to cocaine or anything like that. And so what we're going to do on that is build a puzzle into it. Okay, and so we're going to have the rat solve puzzles, which change every day. Okay, so it has to learn a new puzzle every day in order to get access to cocaine. And so this idea that the rat's having to solve puzzles means that the behavior, the drug seeking, can't be habitual, because they have to do something new every day, just like a person might have to do something new every day to obtain drug. OK, so again, is the development of habitual drug seeking really required for this transition to addiction? And if it's not necessary, what changes in the brain occur? OK, so those are the two questions we're really interested in. So. So here is, does anyone have any questions before I go further? No? So here is the setup so that, that we'll, we'll be using. So the rats, as I said, are going to be solving puzzles every day to obtain the drug. And so here's our little rat. And the puzzles, what they refer to are these three manipulanda that I call, I call them. So there's this fancy looking rolled seeking lever, has a little lip on it. There's a nose poke. Again, remember, rats and rodents like to poke their nose into things. Um, and then there's this wheel. This wheel clicks when the rats spin it. And rats are really smart. They can, they can do these types of things. They can pull a chain. They can hit things. They can do lots of, lots of different things. So they're able to learn these puzzles. And so here's an example of a puzzle. And so you can see, all, all the while, the, the rat is tethered to this infusion pump. So at, at, when it solves a puzzle, it can get the cocaine. So here's an example of the puzzle. In this puzzle, what it has to do on this given day is press this lever three times and then turn this wheel twice. OK? So what the rat's going to do is it's going to press that lever three times, hopefully. And then when it does something correct, there's a signal. It's a beep. It's a tone just telling it it does something correct. Now go do something else. OK? Now. If it goes and does a nose poke next, well, that's incorrect. It was supposed to go to the wheel. So it has to actually restart the puzzle. So this is a difficult task for a rat to do, as you can imagine. It has to figure out what to do in what order to do it. So restarts the puzzle, goes, presses this three times, gets the beep, turns the wheel twice. If it turned the wheel once and then went and did something else, it would have to redo the puzzle again. But let's just say for the, the sake of this, it turns the wheel tw twice, it gets a beep, and then what happens is this lever on the other side of the chamber comes out. Okay? And then for a five minute period, it can press that lever as much as it wants and gets a cocaine infusion for each lever press. So this is the schedule this is on is called the FR1 schedule, which I mentioned before, fixed ratio one. So every lever press is one cocaine infusion. Now, the interesting about, thing about this, too, is um, I'm not going to show you the data for this, but you'd think you know, a rat has five minutes of access to this lever, right? It's probably going to go all out for the five minutes. Well, that's not what it does. It loads up for the first minute and then you know, maybe takes a couple more hits after that, but it sort of stabilizes itself. So this, is again, is suggesting that this intermittent pattern of drug abuse is very important. OK? Because it's only got this five minutes of lever drug access before you know, it has to do a puzzle again and a timeout period again. So the rats load up. And with each lever press, and this will come and be important later, it also gets presentation of this cue light. OK? So each drug infusion, this cue light turns on. And so this cue light we're using as something to measure how well uh, the rats learn about you know, what's going on, and also 
if this Q light can later sort of reinstate drug-seeking behavior. So will, if later on, after weeks and weeks and weeks of this experiment, if we present that Q light, will the rats relapse into pursuit of drug again? Just like you know, that little taste of alcohol or, or, or exposure to a syringe in a person or a spoon or something like that might reinstate or relapse into pursuit of drug. Make sense? OK, so again, oops. so after that, there's this forced timeout period. And so then that's the end of trial one. And so then they go to trial two, and they re redo this same procedure. And so what happens is these, it does 10 of those trials in a given day. Each day is one puzzle. And, it, and the rats do learn that puzzle. They get better at that puzzle across the day. But on the next day, they have to learn a new puzzle. So here are the examples of the puzzles. And the puzzles can actually get harder over the first 20 days. There are actually more puzzles than this, but I'm only you know, interested in these for now. So basically, they consist of one response series followed by a second response series. So for example, they'll have to nose poke once over here, and then go to the seeking lever over here. Okay, But on the last day, it has to you know, press that seeking lever four times, and then nose poke once. And again, these get harder and harder every day. Rats need to change their behavior every day. And so I'm arguing, since their behavior changes constantly, drug seeking can't be a habit. OK, so there's one more um, sort of side story to this that I want to talk about before I get into what rats are actually doing, what their behavior looks like. And so that, that is that not everyone who experiments with drugs actually becomes addicted. Not everyone transitions from this casual drug use once in a while to becoming an addict. And so we're also interested in what factors underlie this susceptibility to drug abuse. Okay, And that's important because we're going to divide the rats up into how addicted they look like. Okay, so we're. Our goal is to look at individual variation in this addiction-like behavior. Okay? And we're going to model this, again, on what has been seen in the human literature and according to the DSM criteria. So for example, our highly addicted rats will meet two to three criteria for addiction, according to our different behavioral tests. And so these criteria will be difficulty stopping drug use or limiting drug intake. OK? So for example, um, they'll continue to pursue drug even when it's not available. Another criteria is extremely high motivation to take drug with activities focused on its procurement and consumption. Um, so again, as I, I mentioned before, one example of this might be willingness to pay more for small doses of the drug. By pay, I mean uh, you know, lever press for a very small dose of a drug. And the final thing is substance use continues despite its harmful consequences. And here again, we're using that continued drug taking despite mild, mild foot shock to sort of model the, the negative things that can happen to a person, uh, whether it's losing the job, having some health issues related to drugs, like a seizure, a kidney failure, or something like that. So we're trying to model these in animals. And we're trying to look and see if there's individual variation in each of these behaviors. And so when I'm showing you the data, I'm going to show you, you know, basically two sets of graphs. One set of graph for animals that don't show any of these criteria, so they are likely to not be addicted. And rats that are highly addicted that meet two to three of these criteria. So the first thing I want to show you is you know, what the rats are doing on the puzzle. Okay, that's the drug seeking. So again, what you have are the rats that show zero addiction criteria compared to two to three criteria. And what I'm comparing is their behavior on the first few puzzles, where only two responses were required, compared to the later puzzles, when five to six responses were required. And you know, because there's a different number of responses required, we're normalizing this to responses per minute. And so what we can see is, you know, across training from early to late training, early training in the white bars, late training in the black bars, there's really not this increase in drug seeking in rats that 
don't show addiction-like behavior. Makes sense, right? But in rats that do show addiction-like behavior, there's this very significant enhancement in drug seeking. So they're more motivated to seek out drug by how much they're responding on the puzzle, how, also how well they're trying to solve the puzzle. OK, so drug seeking increases. Drug seeking increases, but only in rats that meet criteria for addiction. And another thing that we can look at is you know, this escalation of taking. So do the rats take more and more and more drug with repeated you know, training? So again, you have the, the rats that don't really meet any addiction criteria. They actually start out somewhat high in terms of the number of infusions per session that they take. So around 60. They don't really change that much. But these rats, interestingly enough, that show this addiction criteria, that, uh, the two to three addiction criteria, they actually start out lower, but show this big increase in addiction-like behavior, this big increase in the amount of cocaine that they're taking. They go from about 30 infusions per session to 90 infusions per session. So they're you know, tripling the amount of cocaine that they're taking over time. And again, this is comparing the first four to six puzzles to the last uh, 14 to 20 puzzles. Oops. It's the same thing. OK, so, so another thing that we can look at is just general overall motivation for a drug. Are there differences? So what we do is we measure motivation for a drug before all this training and then after all those puzzles, after those 20 puzzles, days of puzzles, OK? And so what we ask is, will, works work, will rats work to defend a preferred level of cocaine when there's increased effort or cost is required to obtain the drug? So what I mean by this is, you know, we put the rats in the chamber. And at first, you know, the rats will press one lever press to get a big dose of cocaine, OK? And they can take as much as they want for a little while. But over time, over the course of that one day, we lower the dose of cocaine gradually to a very, very tiny dose. And we try to see at what point will the rats stop working for that dose of cocaine, OK? At what point is cocaine too expensive for them? Because, again, the rats are solving puzzles this, for the vast portion of this experiment, and the puzzles are preventing habit formation, we're arguing that habit formation might not be required for this enhanced motivation for cocaine, OK? Because the rats never formed habits. OK, so the other thing that you can look at is obtaining drug um, under the adverse consequences situation. So will rats work to defend their preferred level of cocaine even if they're being shocked? And again, as you might expect, there's a lot of individual variation in this. And this, again, sort of reflects the human literature. So here you have you know, your zero criteria rats. Again, this is before and after the four weeks of self-administration. Um, the zero criteria rats actually decrease the amount they're willing to take on in terms of the, the foot shock, whereas the rats that show the two to three addiction criteria, they're willing and actually increase the amount of foot shock that they're willing to endure in order to just get a cocaine infusion. OK? So this is classic sort of continue pursuit of drug despite this negative consequence. OK, so we've now looked at this escalation of drug self-administration, this enhanced motivation for drug, and this continued use despite the negative consequences, OK? So all of these sort of model the human criteria for substance abuse disorder. Another one that we've looked at is propensity for relapse, OK? So this is the big problem in, in drug abuse, right? Just re-exposure to cues you know, causes you to want drug again and take drug again. So can re-exposure to a cue that's previously associated with drug delivery again, promote search for the drug. And so, again, as you might expect, there we go, re-exposure to the cue also reinstates this pursuit of drugs. So here's that cue light again. Remember, it was previously on during the drug infusions. So on this day, what we're doing is we're just 
basically turning on the cue light and seeing what happens in terms of lever presses. And again, you have your zero criteria rats compared to your two to three criteria rats. And what you can see is these addicted rats show much more responding for a drug when just shown that cue light. So the cue is causing them to relapse compared to rats that didn't show these addiction criteria. Good? OK, so this is sort of an interim summary of what we've, I've been talking about before I get into the biology a little bit more. Um, so the dictionary definition of addiction is a compulsive need for and use of a habit-forming substance. So the question is, is this really completely accurate? Um, and I would argue that maybe it's not completely accurate. And the reason why is, in our experiment with the puzzles, habitual drug seeking did not require this motivated self-administration of cocaine and this development of addiction-like behavior. So again, the puzzles, the goal of the puzzles was to prevent habit formation, which we think it did, uh, according to other stuff that I'm not showing you today. And the rats still developed addiction-like behaviors. They still escalated their cocaine use, you know, took it despite foot shock, they relapsed, all these things, OK? All right, so the next part that I want to talk about, and a lot of these you know, are sort of future directions and things that you might be able to get involved with if you're interested in doing some of this work, is what types of neuroplasticity, by neuroplasticity I mean changes in the brain, changes in the cells of the brain, um, underlie the drug seeking that we're looking at. And so I'm going to just give you a little bit of an overview on neurobiology right now. So basically, these are cells of the brain, OK? Um, the, the type of cell in the brain is called a neuron, OK? And they communicate with each other via this electrochemical uh, methods, OK? Via these things called neurotransmitters. I already mentioned dopamine is one. I'll give you an example of that up here. OK, so how do these neurons communicate? So first off, the cells, all these cells in the brain, these neurons, have these areas called dendrites, OK? And these dendrites are what receive information from other cells, other neurons, OK? So and these, these, what the, these dendrites then receive this sort of electrical chemical information and then send electrical pulses to the cell body of the neuron, OK, the center of it, which then is going to integrate this electrical information from all of these different dendrites. OK? So it's all getting integrated right in the cell body right there. So all this information is coming in and being combined. So the next thing that happens is there's this part of the neuron called the axon. And the axon is what sends information out to other neurons. And it does so with this thing called the action potential. OK? And the action potential, what it basically is, is normally if you stick an electrode or st stick some sort of recording instrument directly into the the cell, it's very negatively charged normally. Now, when there's information being sent, what happens is there's a big spike in positive current. OK? And it goes up to like from negative 70 up to like plus 40 millivolts or something like that. And so you have this plus 40 millivolt signal, this action potential, which then travels all the way down to this axon. And that gets the information to other cells. OK? And so what happens is that action potential, that positive p potential, reaches the end of the axon, which are these things called terminals, which I've circled here. And they create what we, I refer to as synapses onto other cells, but specifically onto the dendrites of other cells. OK? So we'll zoom into what that looks like. So again, you have your terminal here, which is a presynaptic neuron. You have this gap between the cells. This is called the synapse or the synaptic cleft. And then you have the next neuron, the postsynaptic neuron. Okay? And that's a, a, a dendrite. So it's one of these little things right here. Okay? And you have neurotransmitter, such as dopamine, that's released f into the synapse from this presynaptic neuron. And then it binds to different receptors and things like that to activate the new next neuron. Okay? 
and you know, the, I, this is an oversimplification. These neurotransmitters can turn on other cells, they can turn off other cells, they can do lots of different things. And there's many ways that they act. Um, but the, the specific neurotransmitter I'm talking about is dopamine. Okay. And another thing is, I, I set up here that these dendrites oftentimes receive information onto these things called dendritic spines. So here's an example of a synapse, one cell type here, another cell type here. These spines, which I'll show you some images of, are these little protrusions that come out and sort of search for input and actually receive the neurotransmitter. Okay? Does this all make sense? Okay, so the question that I'm going to pose now is what types of this plasticity in these neurons occurs after the non-habitual drug seeking? And the other question is, is there any variation across individuals? Um, I don't really know much about the variation right now, but that's something we want to explore uh, later on. So a few big questions here are, are, are there different brain regions that have specific differences? in dopamine neurotransmission. So we can use pharmacology, you know, and inject different drugs and see what happens, maybe dopamine blockers. Um, we can also, as I'll show you, use a technique called fast scan cyclic voltammetry to actually record dopamine in real time as the rats are doing a specific behavior. Another question is we want to know if there's anything happening in the presynaptic cell that might regulate dopamine signaling and anything that's happening in the postsynaptic cell um, to regulate that signaling in the dendritic spine. So we're sort of bridging the synapse here. So we're going to start with this, looking at dopamine transmission. And so this is the last bit of the puzzle data that I'll show you um, before I get into some other ideas. And so what, what we're doing here is after the rats have been responding on the puzzle for weeks and weeks and weeks, what we do is we inject a blocker of dopamine into different brain regions, either into the dorsal lateral striatum, which I told you about before was important for habit formation, or into the nucleus accumbens, the ventral striatum, which is important for motivated behavior. Okay? And you know, as I told you before, too, that you know, since our rats are not forming habits, right? we don't think the dorsal striatum will be involved. Instead, their behavior is motivated. They're motivated to seek drug, so we think that the, the nucleus accumbens, the ventral striatum, will be more important. And so we're going to inject those drugs, and then what we're going to be doing is mo monitoring drug-seeking behavior on a single puzzle. So in this puzzle, what the rats have to do is press this lever four times, and then turn this wheel twice. And so what we see is, and so here what we're doing is we're comparing the two brain regions, injections into those two brain regions, and we're comparing different doses of the drug. And the important thing is that there's no really effect. If anything, there's a bit of an increase in drug seeking uh, after injecting into the dorsal lateral striatum. But at this highest dose of the drug, we're actually blocking drug seeking in the ventral striatum. So what this is suggesting is that motivated drug seeking seems to be dependent on dopamine neurotransmission in some brain areas, the ventral striatum, the nucleus accumbens core, but not in other brain regions, such as the dorsal lateral striatum, that's important for habit. So we're not blocking habits because the rats are not habitually responding. They have to solve a new puzzle every day. It's not automatic. We're blocking habits, or sorry, we're blocking drug seeking in the, by injecting this drug into the accumbens because the accumbens is responsible for motivated behavior. Does this make sense? Yes. Is this juxtaposed then against earlier studies? Yes. So this is the exact opposite finding of the earlier studies. So when a rat is habitually responding, you'd see the exact opposite effect. So in a rat that's responding in a habitual manual, manner, you would get a blockade in the dorsolateral striatum. But 
you wouldn't get a blockade of drug seeking when injecting the drug into the accumbens. Good, so we can, um, I, I didn't do this yet, but we can divide this data into the different groups of rats, you know, that met the zero criteria versus the two to three criteria, and just see if there's individual variation there. That might be, there might be a lot of variation here, and that's why there's lots of big error bars here. Um, but yeah, so that, that's a good thing to look into. Yeah, yeah, so that's, that's what I think um, that we, we should do is we, there is, you know, de there are already drugs out there th that, you know, decrease, you know, motivated responding for, you know, opioid type drugs like morphine and heroin. There isn't that much for things like cocaine, amphetamine right now. Um, and I think, you know, a big part of the problem is why we're, why we're having trouble finding, you know, tr good treatment options is because the models that we're oftentimes using in animals aren't really representative of the human condition. So that, that's what I'm trying to get at here is, you know, people might not be forming habitual drug-seeking behaviors. Instead, they, they might not be habits. They might involve a totally different brain area. So, you know, we should look at, you know, there, there are different treatments for, you know, you know, ways to affect one brain area than another in, in people. And you know we should maybe look into those as well. But you know, start out by developing better animal models that mimic the human condition, and then develop treatments from there. Because if we don't have a good animal model, it would be very difficult to develop a good treatment. Okay, and so getting back to the individual variation a bit. Um, so the one thing I want to concentrate on, because I, my history is you know. Uh, research history is this individual variation in relapse. And I think, you know, relapse is something you really want to target because that's what causes people to, you know, uh, continue to abuse drugs even after periods of withdrawal. So again, this is just a reminder, and I'll keep this up from now on, is that, you know, you have some rats that don't show any criteria for addiction. You have some rats that show two to three criteria, and these two to three criteria rats reinstate, they relapse into drug seeking after exposure to cues, okay? And so one thing that we want to look at first off is if there's any variation in dopamine transmission in these, these rats. And so we can do that pharmacologically like I, I just mentioned, but we can also do it using this other method. And I haven't done this yet. I've done it in a different study, but I just want to share you this, this idea. So what you can do is you can actually record dopamine levels in an awake behaving rat Okay, while they're exposed to these cues. Okay? And what we do, we do this using a technique called fast scan cyclic voltammetry, or FSCV. Okay? And so the area, so this is what the electro looks like. Um, this is what it looks like when mounted on a rat's head. You have uh, the rat connected via some wires to a computer, and you have this thing called a micro manipulator that lowers the electrode into a specific brain area. Um, and this brain area that we're interested in, again, is the nucleus accumbens, okay, because that's where a lot of dopamine is. So there's this other brain area called the ventral tegmental area, which sends these projections to the accumbens and releases dopamine here. So we want to record dopamine there. And it's important to record dopamine there because in that brain region, blocking dopamine reduced drug seeking using our puzzle study. And so this is how this technique works. So what you have is this carbon fiber electrode, okay? And what you do is every 10 times a second, you pass this very small-ish voltage waveform on it. And so what happens is at one point on, on this waveform, dopamine binds to the carbon fiber and it undergoes an oxidation reduction reaction, okay? It gets oxidized and reduced, and you can measure current from that. Okay? And so this is what the data actually looks like. So over here is time, okay, on the y x axis. And the y axis is that voltage waveform. So you're going from negative 0.4 volts up to 1.3 volts down to negative 0.4 volts again. So that's that voltage waveform here. 
And this is repeated 10 times a second. So you can imagine that there's lots of you know, vertical lines here that make up the data as that triangular voltage waveform is repeated across time. And so again, dopamine is oxidized at a specific point on that waveform, which is right here, about 0.8 volts. Okay? And these little blops here, these little green circles, those are uh, current related to the oxidation of dopamine. Okay? So this is current along this line related to dopamine oxidation. And so what we can do is we can then take out the electrode later on, throw some dopamine on it, calibrate it, and convert that current into a dopamine concentration. Okay? And so we know we can measure using this technique, dopamine concentration in sort of real time while the rat's awake and behaving and doing different things. And so it turns out that individuals, as you, as you might guess, individuals vary in the ability of cues to motivate behavior, but they also vary in their dopamine signaling. And so what I've found are two groups of rats. We have some rats that are really motivated by cues, so they might be similar to these guys here. Again, this is a different experiment, different rats. But these rats here are really motivated by cues. And what you can see is when you turn on the cue, when you turn on this cue light, there's a big spike in dopamine concentration, and then it comes down. And you can see this spike right here, this big burst of current. Now we have other rats that are not motivated by cues. So these rats are more like these guys here. And you can see that the dopamine looks totally different, different pattern of dopamine release. So here you have a big spike to the cues too, but you also have a spike to what I'm referring to as the US. That's the delivery of the reward. In this case, they're getting a sugar pellet. Okay? So in these guys, you just get a, that are really attracted to cues. Only the cue causes a spike in dopamine, whereas these guys that are not attracted to cues and don't undergo relapse, only uh, both the cue and delivery of the reward causes dopamine. So. You know, the details aren't important, but you can imagine that if the ability of cues to influence dopamine signaling in real time differs across individuals, these rats here probably have differently functioning dopamine when they're behaving and when they're undergoing or see some sort of stimulus that might provoke relapse. Okay? So, Another question you might ask is, is there any sort of machinery or mechanisms by which that dopamine release is regulated differently in these rats that you know, are motivated by cues versus rats that are not so motivated by cues? And so again, you know, let's just remind you that there's a lot of individual variation in this relapse. Um, and you know, I'll give you a blow up of this Synapse, again, Again, you have the presynaptic neuron here and your postsynaptic neuron here. Dopamine is released into the synapse. It can bind to different receptors and cause some sort of activation down here. But you might imagine that you know, if you get a lot of dopamine release, dopamine has to go somewhere. It can't just float around that synapse forever. So what there is is there's something called the dopamine transporter. What the dopamine transporter does is it actually sucks up dopamine back into the cell and packs it back into these little vesicles to be released again. Okay, so it's a way of cleaning up the synapse so that you don't get too much stimulation. Okay, that the dopamine can't stay out here for way too long. Okay? And in sort of a side note, the dopamine transporter is actually what cocaine binds to, okay? So cocaine, what it does is it actually s s gets stuck in here and plugs up the dopamine transporter, so it can't do its job anymore. So you can imagine what happens then is that dopamine can no longer be cleaned from the synapse, so you get lots and lots of this accumulating dopamine out here, and so that's how cocaine has its effects of increasing dopamine levels, okay? And certain, a lot of drugs, act on these ways, uh, on the system. Amphetamine also acts on this dopamine transporter, sort of a common mechanism. But amphetamine actually causes a lot more dopamine release than cocaine does. Um, okay. So, again, we're interested in individual variation, whether it exists. 
we'll come back to these rats again from that other study, rats that are highly attracted or motivated by cues versus rats that are not. And what we actually see is that there's different expression levels of this dopamine transporter, okay? The rats that are motivated by cues show more of that transporter on the, on the membrane surface right there than rats that aren't motivated by cues. Okay, so not only do they release dopamine to cues and rewards differently, but they have different mechanisms for cleaning up the dopamine when, after everything's said and done. Okay, and so it'd be really interesting to see if this you know correlates with some of these findings too. And, and, and importantly, you know, higher expression levels of the dopamine transporter like this has you know been shown in you know a variety of diseases in, in certain individuals who are addicted to drugs, also in certain populations of people with ADHD. Um, impulsivity kind of goes along with addiction in many cases, so there's some over, overlap there. Um, and so there's, there's lots of avenues to explore this further. Okay, and so the final thing is that what happens to the, the next cell? What happens to the postsynaptic cell, that dendritic spine, once it receives that dopamine? Okay. And again, here's that little image that I'm showing you. Here's your presynaptic cell, for example. Here's your postsynaptic cell. And dopamine or other neurotransmitters are released onto these little dendritic spines on the next cell. And again, we're interested in whether there's individual variation um, because of this, this example of relapse they keep on referring to. And so here is an example. Uh, again, a totally different study, but this is a, these are pictures I took of the dendrites of a cell. So these little protrusions are dendritic spines. I, uh, what I did was I looked at cells that sort of turned on after exposure to a cue, okay? And I physically injected those cells um, with this dye, filled them up with this red dye. And then I used this fancy software to sort of model them, so to fill them in with a computer. And then so that computer image was able to sort of calculate out how big these different spines were. And so what you can see is that exposure to the drug cues actually caused a change in these, how these spines look. So cues, which influence dopamine release, also cause changes on the postsynaptic end. They change the size and shape of these spines. And it turns out they actually only cause these changes in a very small population of cells, cells that turn on when responding to a cue. So you can say that these cells sort of might encode the memory for the drug cue. OK? OK, and then the last thing I want to show is that you know, there are molecular pathways that might underlie these changes in spine shape and size and things like that. And so I'm not going to show you much of the data here, but there are all these you know, complicated proteins and things like that, you know, these structural proteins, these kinases, all different things that you know, become altered when you expose an individual to a drug or a cue or something like that. Um, and these, what they do is when, when, when the structure changes, you might change the excitability of these cells, you might add more receptors for dopamine, for example, or glutamate or something like that, which might be able to turn on the cell better, for example, the spine better. And so that change in the spine size and shape might have these long-lasting consequences on how well these cells can communicate with one another. And we can investigate this with pharmacology, biochemistry, genetics, all sorts of ways. Okay, so I think that cool, what, what really draws me to drug abuse research in general is, in addition to, you know, I think it's a very important topic, that it's a huge problem and, you know, and everything, but it, 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 the, this type of research enables you to look at different levels of, of study. So you can, you know, look at the whole brain level, do like an MRI study of a person, look at, you know, how different brain regions respond to cues. You can look at this, you know, dopamine transmission level in people and also in animals. And you can also sort of dial down to that cellular level again. And you know, it's important to start with really good behavioral models you know, of learning, motivation, and addiction. Um, you know, I, I think this new model you know, with the rats solving puzzles is very representative of how people might 
go and seek out drugs. So you start out with your model. Um, you can look at different brain systems, how they communicate with each other. You know, these are systems involved in reward and learning and motivation, memory, impulsivity, lots of different things. You can see how these different areas talk to one another. You can dial down again, look at those presynaptic terminals, for example, that are releasing the neurotransmitter onto another cell. You can go and look at those postsynaptic specializations, those little dendritic spines that received that information. And you can then go a step further and look at the cell nucleus and see, you know, you know, if you know exposure to a drug or cue causes changes in gene transcription, for example, which might have a long-lasting influence on whether that cell, again, responds later to those same cues, whether that same cell kind of encodes this memory uh, uh, for the drug and the drug cues. And you know, all of these interact. And so it's important to look at these for various different levels. And so you know, just another little overview here. The idea is that you know, there are individual variances and individual differences in susceptibility to addiction. We need to develop good models for this. Um, cues can motivate behavior as well, and there are individual differences in that. And so what we're really interested in is looking at this neural function and neuroplasticity and how that sort of ties these two areas together. OK? And so with that, you know, there's a variety of people I wanted to thank. Um, so Dr. Terry Robinson, Brandon Aragona, and Peggy Negge are people I work with now. Um, Paul Vesna is at the University of Chicago. And a lot of this work was done by various undergraduates and technicians and other people who have been really, really helpful in, in designing and implementing these. So thank you.